vous êtes à la recherche de la meilleure formation professionnelle en matière de santé Des cours en ligne ou en présentiel Des ateliers pratiques, des conférences, des congrès, mais aussi des symposiums, des webinaires et bien plus encore BK Med Event est la meilleure plateforme de connexion entre les professionnels de la santé et les acteurs de la formation continue. Sur la plateforme en ligne de BK Med Event, vous allez retrouver tout ce qu'il vous faut. Des prestataires du monde entier réunis en un seul endroit. Et si vous êtes des prestataires de la formation continue, nous avons une bonne nouvelle pour vous aussi. Juste restez focalisés sur votre programme scientifique et BK Med Event se charge du reste. De l'inscription des professionnels de la santé à la remise des attestations en passant par une campagne de communication professionnelle pour mettre en valeur vos projets. Bonjour à tous. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, je suis Dr. Nabil Watik. Je voudrais commencer par remercier Bekamed et le groupe Tawassoul. Aujourd'hui, euh, nous sommes chanceux d'avoir avec nous euh, des invités, trois invités et moi-même. Donc, je suis Dr Nabil Loatik de Montréal, au Canada. Nous avons avec nous euh, Richard Widmer, euh, qui a reçu sa maîtrise en dentisterie pédiatrique de l'Université de Melbourne en Australie, et qui depuis plus de 30 ans pratique à Westmead Center for Oral Health et au Children's Hospital à Westmead, à Sydney, en Australie. Il a publié de nombreux livres et, et euh, a été président de l'Association internationale de dentisterie pédiatrique. Euh, et son livre très connu, Handbook of Pediatric Dentistry, en est maintenant à sa troisième édition et a été traduit en sept langues. Nous avons aussi avec nous euh, le professeur Mark Shifter, euh, qui euh, est un diplômé euh, de l'Université de Sydney et aussi un spécialiste en médecine buccale. Euh, et il supervise le programme de maîtrise en médecine buccale à l'Université de Sydney. Euh, il a été euh, chef du département de médecine Bucal, de pathologie buccale et de dentisterie pour personnes à besoins particuliers à l'hôpital Westmead. Et pour ma part, Nabil Watik, donc euh, euh, affilié avec l'Université McGill à Montréal. Et finalement, je présente aussi professeur Mustapha El Aloussi, euh, anciennement. Euh, professeur à la faculté de médecine dentaire de Rabat. Donc sur ce, je vais passer la parole à Richard uh, Widmer, professeur Widmer. I will uh, now uh, let uh, Richard Widmer start his uh, wonderful presentation on uh, children uh, and looking at children. So Richard, uh, It's for you. Good morning. Shall I start? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to talk to you this morning and, and, and uh, on oral pathology in children. And I'd just firstly like to thank the organizers for having invited me along. And I'm looking forward to this presentation with colleagues. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank the many children re registrars or trainees in pediatric dentistry and and uh, pediatric dental colleagues who i've worked with over the years and who've contributed to uh, much of the material that i present today so looking and seeing oral pathology in children now the symbol of batman we're all familiar with the symbol of batman uh, but some of us also see two upper teeth and four lower teeth. My presentation today is about looking at children and making sure we see everything there, not just looking at children. So when you look at the Batman symbol, you also have to see the teeth as well. 
Many years ago, Addison, who was very well known in medicine, wrote, everyone is in some degree a master of that art, which is physiognomy. And naturally forms to themselves the character of a stranger from the features of the face. So we all get very used to looking at faces and judging people. And the beliefs persisted for a long time to be able to look at somebody, particularly child, and, and make a judgment on their appearance uh, and their teeth of what they would be like and often would impact negatively on the level of oral care for a child. So when we look at these two children, we make a, an assessment straight away of these two kids. And one of them perhaps looks like he needs some special extra attention and i'll let you decide which one that is but already we've all looked at those two faces and made some decisions about those children and their ability to cooperate and understand and their development particularly their intellectual development well we look at a face like this young person that says everything about a, a, a very sad life that this person had lived and it's written in their face. So we all get used to looking at faces and judging, and we might notice the vitiligo around the mouth of this young lady. And where did that come from? So as clinicians, we try to make the clinic uh, an oasis of acceptance and understanding, somewhere where families can come and talk to us and feel their children are not on display they don't need to explain or, or justify their child who may be difficult or may be quite different. And we have to be especially patient and understanding if we're going to get the best from our discussions with the family and the child and, and arrange treatment and care for that child. So we need to make our clinics, our surgeries, our offices, an oasis of acceptance and understanding. This is me looking at uh, working with a family of children and uh, getting a lot of help. Another colleague is an orthodontist, is very good with special needs and he's getting a young boy with Down syndrome to examine him as part of his way of getting some care undertaken for this young man. So always keep the child and family in mind. We need empathy to discuss sensitive issues, such as variations of expected appearance or behavior. And our language must avoid alienating children and families. And sometimes the wonderful variations in human form that we see may or may not be a health concern. Perhaps that unusual appearance is a family trait that everyone looks like each other is not pathology, it's just the family. So we need to keep these things in mind and always approach our discussions carefully. Well, how do we describe a human face? What is it that we recognize inherently? Do we look for an even symmetrical face and body? Do we notice eyes and eye color or hair, distribution of hair? Ears, are they low set? Are they rotated? Are they, is there a prominent pinna? Uh, hands or feet, do we notice the way a child walks or and their hands? And of course, sometimes we need to look at toenails and fingernails to see if they're growing and, uh, and so forth. With growth occurs, we need to look at the fontanelles and suture closer, head circumference. And of course, we can look at skin, we can look at color, the texture uh, and the feel of skin. For these two children, the child, the child on my left, we're assessing her and we notice that her eyes um, perhaps are wide apart. They are hyper Or is that just a, a guess or can we measure that? Yes, we can measure that. There are norms that we can go to and for uh, Caucasian people or uh, 
Middle Eastern people or Chinese background or Asian background, we can get a series of norms and decide is the child's interpupillary distance or their inner canthus or outer canthal distances, are they within a usual limit or not? We can look at the distribution of hair, eyebrows, for example, and we can look at the width of the nose, uh, the length of the philtrum, uh, the width of the oral commissure. All of these things we can look at and measure and develop an idea of where a child may fit into a particular background. The child on my right, uh, um, this young person with definite frontal bossing, a prominent forehead, uh, but all within limits and, and discussing children in this manner, it is important to, for me to say that I'm, uh, I'm not commenting on the pathology in a negative way. I'm more trying to discuss the child's appearance in a way that's constructive for us to help the child uh, if, we need, if we can and to find out if there's a medical background or special background that can be identified by their appearance. So this young lady has frontal bossing has wider part eyes, is hypertiloric. And as you discuss more with uh, the family, uh, she has hypoplastic clavicles and has multiple supernumerary teeth. For this young person, uh, there's a particular uh, facial classification of a, of a tapering face. And if we look at the hands, we can comment on the hand, the length of the fingers and the length of the long finger-like thumb and make discussions for a child's uh, background with that. A lot of people put a lot of interest in the um, dermatoglyphics or the, the architecture of the hand, particularly the palm of the hand, the creases, the whirls of the skin uh, and the fingertip pads and what they look like and put a lot of... Uh, a lot of diagnostic uh, um, acumen in assessing the hands well. And there's, uh, for example, the ring finger, the in ring finger is uh, just slightly uh, shorter than the index finger or not. And people examine the hand very carefully and look for these signs and, and, and make predictions. Uh, not always with um, accuracy. So certainly looking at the hand, feeling a child's hand, is the skin rough? Is the hand warm? Checking the nails, looking at the nails uh, for a child with maybe a cardiac background and noticing the shape of the nails and the colour. Sometimes noticing the mouth, the oral commissure. And for this child, the oral commissure is different on the child's uh, right-hand side. There's a flattening out of the muscles on the lower right where a muscle isn't working and the lip shape is different. And this is a child who has a background of the so-called asymmetric crying face. And the muscle depressor anguli oris uh, is either not working fully or is absent. And the orbicularis oris acts in a different way on that part of the mouth. An interesting thing about the asymmetric crying face is its association with other anomalies from renal and cardiac and digit anomalies. In profile, uh, we get to look at a, a, a child and make some comment on the position of the ear, uh, the nasolabial angle, the general profile, uh, and comment on whether a child may have ears that are low set or rotated or whether the maxilla is underdeveloped and the nasolabial angle of the child on the right hand side is more obtuse as opposed to acute on the left hand side. So in profile again is quite important to assess a child and get some important information. It may be looking at a child, we look at the distribution of hair, and sometimes that can be a normal distribution. Sometimes that can be an unexpected hair, uh, maybe on the ear like this, or the eyebrow, uh, synophorus, 
been the word for one continuous eyebrow and are these diagnostic or suggestive of diagnoses uh, and need to be noted and of course hands and skin we talked about before and the hand of a child who has papillon lefebvre uh, and i hope my french is almost passable when i say that um, and the hyperkeratotic hands and feet of a child with the background of papillon lefebvre syndrome We talked briefly before about hands and looking at the fingernails, but of course, if the fingernails uh, of a child who has uh, a cardiac background, you see the child on the left has her, um, her cheeks are flushed, her male are flushed, and her lips look less than well oxygenated. And you look at her hands and you feel them and, and it's hard to note the fingernails because there's nail polish on. But Again, looking at the fingernail beds are very, is very important. And there's a close-up of a child with a cardiac background, noting the change in color of the fingernail bed. And finally, this is a young guy who at a very young age, in the first uh, six to 12 months of life, was presenting with a flush uh, on his right-hand side on his cheek when e eating certain foods. And here he is a little bit older. But the important thing about this uh, appearance of, of, of a, a redness on his cheek um, that looked very much like the Nike swoosh, the Nike swoosh uh, on, on, um, on, a, on a pair of shoe, running shoes, uh, it appeared to happen with certain foods and tasting and, and caused the family quite a lot of anxiety about was there a uh, analogy or um, a possible uh, risk of anaphylaxis to something but the key factor here uh, again in assessing a child and getting a good history is the fact this little boy was born uh, with force of delivery and it was an urgent delivery and he was got out fairly quickly and forceps were used and he suffered a, a crushing injury over his condyle on the left hand side this is called Frey's syndrome, and Frey's syndrome uh, results in altered, um, it's called gustatory sweating, altered sweating pattern and taste pattern on that side of the face. And there's a little summary of, of, of Frey's syndrome. It affects the cutaneous distribution of the auricular temporal nerve. Uh, it can happen in, in other situations for older people, post-surgery or trauma, but uh, a little one presenting like this, a birthing history is very important. So I've looked at, in, in general terms, some of the aspects that we might notice in a child's face and appearance. We haven't mentioned a lot about uh, behavior. And of course, in, in, in our work with children, uh, assessing a child's behavior uh, and uh, predicting their background and uh, how they'll cope with dental care uh, is very important. And we'll, and we'll all have our own uh, ways of, of recognizing, but once some of the important things uh, can be eye contact and attention span in the dental environment when talking with the child and family and noticing the relationships with the family and the child's behavior and, of course, the history from the family. But certainly eye contact is a, a very useful one and the child's behavior uh, where they might start uh, avoiding approaching the dental chair by hand flapping or uh, turning away and looking at all signs of some neurodiversity that may be developing in a young child. But, it, uh, but our, our, our role in seeing children is to recognize these issues and decide how we can help a family or if they're important. And of course, we have dental parameters when we're looking and seeing in a child's face. We look at the skeletal factors and, and make comments on developing uh, class one or two or three dental patterns. We look at the dentition and, and we're all familiar with the, the size and shape, the importance of those things, the, the position of the teeth, the number of teeth and the relationships over jet and over bite. But don't underestimate the importance of thoroughly assessing the dentition 
um, and, and the quality of enamel and so forth in making a, a, an important um, assessments of children. But I think just as importantly is the soft tissue. Um, it, the, the oral soft tissues really are, I like to call them the canary in the immunological mind or the immunological world. The periodontium is so crucial um, at telling us a lot about a child and, and, and predicting what's going on and from a very early age. So I, I really focus on assessing the periodontium, particularly the gingivae, uh, early on, and then of course, um, more late, late, uh, later on, that the periodontal tissues get involved. Uh, we need to assess those, but they're very important. So, for example, in, an, in, in young children, when teeth are first coming through, we often see the primary immune deficiencies manifesting. And here's a child with the background of Langerhan cell histiocytosis, and this child has presented with. Um, a significant intraoral uh, um, uh, lesion in the right in the in the child's right maxilla. Um, they have other features like a pronounced rash around their nappy area, um, cradle cap in the hair, and and behind the ears, the, the skin is often split and damaged. And certainly, other immune deficiencies like leukocyte adhesion defects. Uh, as well present in this first year of life. So the, the, uh, the gingival tissues are absolutely crucial in, uh, for assessment. I was going to look at lots of different things, but I'm going to pick out two areas. So we're going to look at hands and then I'll look at mouth, uh, given the time we have. So in, for hands, looking at the nail bed, uh, we talked about, um, skin, the touch, the finger length and profile, and certain syndromes, for example, uh, um, um, LAD syndrome, a uh, long finger-like thumb, clinodactyly, and you'll all be familiar with Marfan syndrome, the first syndrome to be really described as a syndrome with its uh, arachnodactyly and uh, the effect of, of um, uh, the effect of, of um, the, uh, the height and the cardiac background and the um, arm width are very important in, in assessing Marfa. Let's look at some hands. We looked at hands before with the length of the little finger. We looked at the uh, length and the thumb, the long, thin thumb. Or it might be someone whose hands are not formed properly, uh, malformed and have different world patterns on them. It may be the finger pads on the right hand side of a child with Kabuki syndrome, or a child, you notice, who's harming themselves and biting themselves. Uh, there's a lot to be got from touching, looking, and assessing a hand. And as we talked about, uh, a lot of people put um, much store in dermatoglyphics, the naturally occurring ridges on the palms and soles of fingers and toes. Um, and, and whether this provides um, adjunctive value in diagnosis in general medical conditions uh, is up to, for discussion, but a lot of people feel they do. For example, in Kleinfelder syndrome, excess arches and loops and whirls, coup de char, single palmar crease, as in Down syndrome as well, um, for example. Um, so let's, let's quickly look at some eyes. Uh, and assessing children, atosis is very important. Was that there always? Is that a new presentation for a child? Um, and suggestive of things changing, or is it something that's always a part of that child's background? But certainly important to notice that drooping eyelid. We talked about hypotelarism, the close set eyes, uh, and the single maxillary meeting central incisor syndrome where there's just one incisor and the child has a downsloping palpable, a downsloping eye sockets and a square tapering face. As a slightly older child, you see the similarity in the facial pattern of the more closely set eyes, the hypotelarism and the uh, midline single tooth. Sometimes we might notice a coloboma of the iris, a keyhole 
in the in the in the iris, which is quite important in this young lady with the first arch defect on her right hand side and a coloboma as well. Of course, you'll all be familiar with the blue eyes of osteogenesis imperfecta. The blue scleri, I should say, not the blue eyes, the blue scleri. Sometimes you get tricked and this young man's eye, you notice on the upper photo, um, he's looking at us and then he looks away and you realize that the eye on his right is a prosthesis. A squint. Now, sometimes as a clinician, you might be the first time, first person to notice a child uh, with a failure of evenness in tracking of the eyes as they move. And it can be often that families don't notice it and you as a clinician do. So it's important to notice that. Or it may be uh, superior rectus palsy when a child goes to look up uh, their, and their eye eyeball rotates upwards because of a, a issue with the superior rectus muscle. All these things, you can be the first person to seriously notice these uh, because the family have not often seen them. It may be pupil size. And this young lady had lost, uh, has very poor sight in her right eye. You notice the difference in pupil size. And that's very important to notice. Sometimes though, this can be a difference in pupil size as a result of, of, of care in oncology, uh, as an oncology patient and damage to the cervical chain. Or in this case, it was a bit of a trick where the young lady has had eye drops put in on her right eye. Again, uh, in seeing children, the, uh, this is called a, a, the Marcus Gunn reflex, where a child opens their mouth and gets uh, eye drooping, it gets the gets ptosis of the eyelid. Uh, and it uh, has some implications um, for um, management later on. Heterochromia, uh, different colored eyes, uh, is very important to notice. And in this case, there's a background of what known as Wardenberg syndrome, where there's uh, hair, uh, color changes in hair, in eyes, and these can persist. And there's also um, hearing loss, um, sensor neural hearing loss. For children with this background. And sometimes again, you get a surprise, there's nothing wrong with the eye, but being swimming and stung by a jellyfish. So just to, to close out, but let's talk about another five minutes on, uh, on the mouth uh, and what it tells us in assessing a child. Uh, the, the typical tenting or pouting expression of a child with muscle weakness and certain, uh, um, um, certain muscle presentations um, um, where there's muscle weakness will present like this. We mentioned the uh, primary immune deficiencies. But then again, sometimes the mouth looks reasonable and it's not till you probe gently and you get significant bleeding that the underlying neutrophil function defect uh, or immune in problem is identified. Again, the, uh, the uh, gingival tissues are absolutely crucial in assessing a child's health. The oral presentations are of what we mentioned before, we saw the young person's hand and here we see the uh, um, uh, very significant periodontal disease with papillon de fevre. Something that's uh, seen a little more often than not, particularly with children, from neurodiverse backgrounds who are, have a very poor diet uh, or have special needs in general, uh, a, a case of scurvy. And uh, this happens um, a little more regularly than we expect. And it could well be an example of a peripheral giant cell presentation, but scurvy uh, was the diagnosis in this particular case. We talked about early loss of primary teeth, cyclic neutropenia, uh, is a very important presentation of early loss of primary teeth. Hyperphosphatasia. All these things are happening. I will present to you as uh, coming as, uh, as clinicians and the family will be saying, discussing early loss of primary teeth. Is there important background to it? And what could be the reason? Or is it just uh, um, part of that child's early development? 
it's very important to follow through. And of course, unfortunately, in some situations, early loss of teeth may be associated with unexpected um, non-accidental injuries for children. Persistent oral bleeding. Uh, and this can be from uh, erupting teeth, which is always a surprise, or it can be from minor oral trauma, uh, a week after minor oral trauma. And this is very important to follow through. In many situations, the child will have a bleeding disorder as they did in this case, from just a minor dental trauma, tearing the, the frenum, the uh, upper frenum, and still bleeding a week later. Well, very important is, again, another source of oral bleeding and being worried and uh, persistent oral bleeding uh, is the family telling you these teeth might be loose, the gingival tissues are very red and inflamed, and an atrial venous malformation. Uh, this is a child that has uh, um, uh, arterial pressure blood in a reservoir under those teeth. And of course, if those teeth come out unexpectedly, then the child uh, will often exsanguinate and lose their life because it's a very serious presentation. But again, recognizing the gingival tissues, taking seriously the discussions of bleeding and uh, may not always be there or maybe blood on the pillow overnight and so forth. It's very important to follow through with these inform this information from the families. A bifid uvula uh, in a child with uh, a background of poor speech uh, and you can see uh, poorly oxygenated with uh, with uh, with um, the, the color of her lips, the malar flush. And this is the uh, association of Schwinson syndrome or the chromosome 22Q deletion. So how important it is to notice the shape of the uvula and, and the, note the function of the uvula and getting the family history about the child's feeding practices and getting some idea that the soft palate is not working as it should. Interesting one is, is the hyperplasia of the second primary molars at being indicative of early uh, in gastrointestinal uh, concerns. And um, there's a number of papers discussing this. And it's also, also it's very important to note that in your assessment uh, and get a history uh, and, and people follow through, is there any background uh, uh, possible inflammatory bowel disease and so forth in a child presenting with hyperplasia of the second primary molars? The talk, this is the image of the asymmetric crying face with the, uh, the, the, the obicular osiris acting as a strap muscle and forcing those, uh, the, the alteration to the arch in the lower right segment. Orofacial granulomatosis and perioral swelling. Uh, my colleague Mark will be talking more about this, but we need to note uh, the gingival tissues um, and how different again they are. The importance of recognizing gingival tissues uh, and sometimes the buckle, the pouch, mucosal folds, all indicative of familial granulomatosis. Something to consider again in assessing children is, 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 uh, is erosion of the dentition either by asymptomatic gastroesophageal reflux or deliberate uh, um, um, vomiting, induced vomiting and the damage to the dentition as well as considering the dietary needs. So I'm aware that I'll need to finish up shortly, but I want to point out the, the thinness of enamel. And when you're assessing the child, the broken chipped edges of enamel, of the central incisors. Uh, and the thought as a clinician is in a young person like this, why is the, why are the teeth so damaged and what could have caused that? Um, and to then investigate with a thorough history. Ectodermal dysplasia is another important presentation uh, that we have in, uh, in assessing children and the position, size, shape of the dentition becomes important. And as you know, uh, the salivary glands are only partially ectodermal in origin, but you'll find many children with this background have uh, altered salivary flow, as you can see, a, a, a bubbly saliva indicative of poor salivary flow in the background of ectodermal dysplasia.
a young person with that, with the uh, lack of hair, a lack of eye, scalp hair, eyebrows and eyelashes and an overclosure of the teeth with the aversion of the lower lip and a rolling in and under of the upper lip. So I'm going to uh, uh, stop sharing. I think I'll leave. I'm, I'm just about done with my time. Uh, and if moderator could uh, let me know how, if that's okay, uh, I should finish up shortly. I'd just like to go right to the end. I want to go, I have a few slides here. I haven't, I'm not going to get the cover. I want to just go back and say, when we look at children, uh, treat them carefully, look at them carefully, and we can really make a difference in their long-term oral futures by our careful examination, looking and seeing. Thank you. Nabil, you're muted. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much. Amazing presentation. Uh, so I do have a question here from the audience. And the question is, is there a situation that you can remember where you diagnosed a child before pediatricians and, and everybody else? And the child was diagnosed essentially because of what you found. One that you can really remember where yes. it made a major difference in the child's life. Yes. Um, the child with the Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Um, particularly, uh, we've seen several of these children now uh, and th they've been referred to us and we've initiated the care for those children by the recognition of that presentation. Uh, and as well, the uh, things like the Frey syndrome, where the family had um, got lots and lots of opinions uh, and that hadn't gone anywhere and the parents were on the internet looking for unusual uh, causes and, and it just needed uh, again to sit and listen to the, the family and get a thorough history. Uh, and I think many of the other, the dental presentations, particularly ectodermal dysplasia um, uh, and children who may have presented with ectodermal dysplasia when they've been quite young, even nine or ten months and had a febrile convulsion because of not of the family not understanding that the child did not control their temperature well and have sought care and it's been put down to a viral illness and infection but if you look at the mouth and look at the dentition and look at the development of the gum pads it's pretty obvious straight up that this is a background of ectodermal dysplasia and we and discussing this with the family and then the uh, the other pediatrician the pediatricians for example or the other uh, can it clinicians involve the family? Uh, it changes everything. Um, okay, uh, perhaps one last question before we move on to the next uh, presentation. Was there any situation where delayed eruption of the teeth, just generalized delayed eruption of the teeth, which is a common complaint or, or concern from parents, ended up being something more serious than simply delayed eruption of the teeth. And I'm not talking about ectodermal dysplasia or anything like that, but just somebody who's very, very, very slow in getting their teeth. I mean, the, the, the very obvious one, of course, is where there's a, a cranial dysplasia, where the, there can be a loss of some primary teeth, but often very delayed exfoliation simply because of the, the many supernumeraries that are present in the, in the alveolus, in the maxilla or the mandible. That's one presentation. I, there are background um, medical conditions, of course, and special needs from Down syndrome and so forth, where there is a general delayed eruption. But is it significant? Is it consequential? Um, uh, um, my colleague, Mark, uh, or my other colleagues involved may well have further comments about that. I'm just trying to think of uh, delayed eruption, a uh, delayed arrival. Um, I've seen children of 20 months who've not had any teeth at all. 
and appear to have well-formed gum pads and no sign of um, ectodermal dysplasia. And often within a, by two, two, two and a half, most of the teeth appear. I've never ever gone and exposed teeth or anything like that in an infant to get them through. On the other hand, uh, when you're delayed exfoliation, I think I'd always have uh, some imaging to make certain, for example, the teeth are present. There was no other pathology uh, causing a problem. But I don't, wouldn't just say, oh, they're just delayed. I would do some investigations. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I think now uh, we were going to move with uh, Professor Ella Lucy, if he's available. Uh, donc ce serait pour uh, Professeur Alussi, s'il est disponible. Oui. Et donc, euh, Professeur, je vous invite donc à euh, lancer votre présentation. Alors, on passe à une portion francophone. Uh, so now we are on a French uh, version of the talk. And uh, c'est à vous. Euh, euh, Nabil Oui euh, Vous regardez ma présentation Pas encore, il faut euh, juste euh, indiquer euh, present, euh, present et vous, donc vous pesez sur ce bouton et euh, on pourra Merci. à ce moment-là procéder. Voilà. Et vous choisissez l'écran. Euh, Je mets bien pour. Voilà. Maintenant, vous regardez Partagez l'écran. Oui. oui. Vous êtes à la recherche de la meilleure formation professionnelle en matière de santé Des cours en ligne ou en présentiel Des ateliers pratiques, des conférences, des congrès, mais aussi des symposiums, des webinaires et bien plus encore BK Med Event est la meilleure plateforme de connexion entre les professionnels de la santé et les acteurs de la formation continue. Sur la plateforme en ligne de BK Med Event, vous allez retrouver tout ce qu'il vous faut. Des prestataires du monde entier réunis en un seul endroit. Et si vous êtes des prestataires de la formation continue, nous avons une bonne nouvelle pour vous aussi. Juste restez focalisés sur votre programme scientifique et BK Med Event se charge du reste de l'inscription des professionnels de la santé à la remise des attestations en passant par une campagne de communication professionnelle pour mettre en valeur vos projets. Alors, Alors je dois mettre... mettre... Nabil Oui. Euh, je vais présenter. Oui. Partagez l'écran. Hein. Partagez l'écran et puis faire avec deux écrans. Oui. Je mets streaming. Oui. Maintenant, c'est bien oui, oui. On, on est bien. Donc là, il suffit de mettre la Qu'est-ce que je fais la vie, je fais la vie, la vie. Vous êtes à la recherche de la meilleure formation professionnelle en matière de santé Des cours en ligne ou en présentiel Des ateliers pratiques, des conférences, des congrès, mais aussi des symposiums, des webinaires et bien plus encore 
BK Med Events est la meilleure plateforme de connexion entre les professionnels de la santé et les acteurs de la formation continue. Sur la plateforme en ligne de BK Med Events, vous allez retrouver tout ce qu'il vous faut. Des prestataires du monde entier réunis en un seul endroit. Et si vous êtes des prestataires de la formation continue, nous avons une bonne nouvelle pour vous aussi. Juste restez focalisé sur votre programme scientifique et Becamed Events se charge du reste. De l'inscription des professionnels de la santé à la remise des attestations en passant par une campagne de communication professionnelle pour mettre en valeur vos projets. Ah, il y a un Là-bas, je dois faire quoi Nabil Oui, donc, euh, présenter, euh, présente. Ensuite, euh, soit partage d'écran, mais on choisit uniquement l'écran qui euh, est la présentation. Donc, uniquement la fenêtre euh, window euh, qui est la présentation. De, de, je crame la fenêtre sur l'écran. Fenêtre. Que je... Window. Oui, Et alors, uh, so, Miss Professor Schifter, uh, offers to go ahead. Donc, euh, le professeur Mark Schifter pourra euh, euh, procéder avec sa présentation. Et euh, à ce moment-là, on aura la chance de revenir. So, we'll have the chance to come back. Uh, with uh, Professor L. Lucy. Uh, Professor Schefter, it's uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Now, I'm having difficulty in um, presenting. <laughs> 
hopefully you can hear this. There you are. Yeah. Uh, there was some, there's a problem with the IT in terms of getting the, uh, seeing, finding the screen. So finally got it right. I do apologize. Thank um, you. Thank you so new much. technology and all that. So anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, I'll apologize in advance. I tend to speak very quickly. I, I don't have the measured professional tone of Professor Widmer, so I do apologize in advance. Uh, so I hail from Sydney, Australia. I work with Professor uh, Widmer, and um, I've just been newly appointed to the Children's Hospital in my role as a specialist in our medicine. So it's a real pleasure to speak uh, to you today. So I was tasked with presenting the own manifestations of gastrointestinal disease. And this should not come as a surprise to us, but as the mouth is an integral part of the gastrointestinal system, though because it's very different physiology and indeed epithelial surfaces, we tend to discount the oral cavity as being part of the gastrointestinal tract. And so we should not be surprised that there are a variety of gastrointestinal diseases which will have distinct presentations or complications that we'll be able to see in the oral cavity. And importantly, as a consequence of this, we can sometimes make a diagnosis maybe earlier than might have been achieved if the patient's uh, mouth changes or oral changes and had not been observed. So as I said, there's a variety of parts of the gastrointestinal system which have distinct appearances in the oral cavity. Now, of course, <clears throat> Richard already mentioned in passing, when we see and have a look at the patient's dentition, if we're seeing gross loss of tooth substance, particularly if it's generalized, we have to start thinking to ourselves by what disease process could we have this substantial tooth loss? And there's very limited number of disease processes that are gonna result in tooth loss, particularly on an extensive stage. So when we're seeing widespread tooth loss like this, it might be where, but there has to be some other factor that we need to thinking about. And this is a, of course, severe dental erosion is basically chemical trauma that is an acid attack or acid dissolution of the substance of the teeth. So whenever we see this level of erosion, the thought that needs to occur to us is what is the source of the acid? Now, is the acid coming from the patient themselves, i.e. the gastric contents or the, the stomach contents and the acid that's found within, or is there an extrinsic source of acid? And some children, um, unfortunately, uh, may have been given external forms of acid in the form of lemon juice or citric juices to excessive amounts, which might have resulted in the tooth wear. But as you'd appreciate, if the source of the acid is extrinsic and it's coming through the front part of the mouth, you'd see excessive wear towards the front part of the mouth. Whereas with intrinsic gas, uh, acid, that is from the gastric contents and its regurgitation, we tend to see either posterior involvement or more generalized involvement. Now, gastric reflux generally is very, very common in young children and is rarely very severe. But when we're seeing severe intrinsic dental erosion, you need to be asking yourself, is there some neuromuscular problem that may contribute to the excessive acid, i.e. there is some impairment of the gastroesophageal uh, sphincter which was resulting in large amounts or more or frequent amounts of the gastric contents of the stomach finding its way into the mouth. And of course, the changes are almost exclusively of the hard tissues to teeth. And that's because the soft tissues have are well protected by saliva and tend not to show the adverse effects or whatever adverse effects are of the soft tissue tends to be transitory. Now, of course, the other way we can get the gastric contents to return to the oral cavity is if this is done deliberately. And all of us are familiar to a certain degree of anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. So these are generally young women and younger uh, girls who believe their body form is too fat and either purge and diet or eat and then regurgitate the stomach contents so they don't digest the food they've eaten. And with this, we tend to see particular forms of dental ero erosion, more of the posterior part of the teeth with quite marked cupping of, uh, of the two surfaces. What you'll also tend to see is signs of chronic trauma as this is by stimulating the gag reflex, 
this is how these patients can ensure that the gastric contents returns to the oral cavity. Now, a consequence of this constant gagging is that there's chronic salivary stimulation because the saliva, of course, is naturally induced and made to try and protect the teeth and also the soft tissues from the adverse effects of the acid. So you'll get yeah. consequently parotid hyperplasia. And that's what's seen. Professor Schechter, I, 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 I need to uh, ask you to have yeah. a look at the presentation to make sure that you are able to share the screen that is actually the presentation, which are slides that you are looking at. Okay. Uh, because so far we were looking at your PowerPoint, but it wasn't moving. So I guess okay. it may have been the other window. Right. Let's try again. No, that's not working either. Can you see a color photograph now? So right now we are seeing the, the PowerPoint and, uh, but the ideal is if you are able to go in presentation mode. I'll do that now. And then that we can look at that window of the presentation mode, which typically ends up becoming another window. Right. Can you see my slides now? Uh, we can see your PowerPoint master. Right. Are you seeing, is the slides moving at all? Uh, no, not 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 in not in that screen. We're seeing the the basic yeah, okay. uh, PowerPoint. So the the problem is okay. Are you seeing my slides now? Yes, uh, we are seeing your slides, but not in presentation mode. That's okay. Are the slides moving? They are, yes. So you're seeing the slides advancing forwards and backwards? Affirmative. Okay, let's go to presentation mode. And again, are the slides moving forwards and backwards? We're not seeing the presentation mode screen. Okay. Well, the, once I got the presentation mode, it's lost. So I think we're going to have to stick with this format. Understood. Okay. So you can see my slides and I've advanced the slide by one. You can see that now there's a map. Yeah. Okay. As soon as I go to presentation mode, unfortunately, um it seems to drop out okay so just give me a second and i'll adjust this a little okay right so uh let's just catch up where we left off so as you've heard me mention in the introduction um it's not surprising that a fair number of gastrointestinal diseases, particularly from discrete parts of the gastrointestinal system, will present with oral manifestations and on occasions oral complications. We already mentioned in passing dental erosion, and I was particularly focused on dental erosion due to intrinsic sources of acid, as we see in this young lady here with bulimia, uh, bulimia nervosa where she is deliberately inducing her gag reflex to regurgitate the stomach contents after eating a meal. Now, this has very distinct oral and indeed dental present presentations and features. On intro examination, you'll see quite marked erosion with cupping, particularly towards the uh, teeth, the more posterior teeth. Now, as a consequence of this, we'll also see 
because of the chronic trauma due to the patient inducing their gag reflex, you'll get this necrotizing sinilator metaplasia, which is basically chronically traumatized minor salivary glands of the central soft palate. Concurrently with this, on extra examination, and it may be subtle, so one has to look specifically for this, but there'll be a consequential parotid hyperplasia. And that's because that the injection through the power now, uh, through the autonomic ner nervous system is on gagging, we immediately start making large amounts of saliva, very much basically to protect the teeth from the acid contents of the stomach. So this is not a surprising finding. And of course, this is a very serious and indeed life-threatening condition uh, where patients need to be appropriately identified and receive the appropriate psychiatric and indeed physiological interventions. Now, recurrent aphthous ulceration is very familiar for all of us who look after children, and they generally start at about the ages of four to five and can generally last through teenage years. And as the child matures, generally become less prevalent, uh, certainly in their 20s. That's not to say that adults can't de novo also present with recurrent aphthous ulcers. And this is a classic aphthous ulcer that we see here. So a nice yellow-white necrotic base with a typical erythematous halo, and it's a quite symmetrical ulcer. And the other important finding is that the pain from this ulcer is disproportionate to the size of the ulcer. So it is a relatively common and the most common form of aphthous ulceration is recurrent minor. So these are ulcers generally smaller than one centimeter, lasting one to two weeks before emitting, and then a further crop of ulcers occurring. The etopathogenesis of this condition is not particularly well understood. Um, what we do know, there are other variations of recurrent aphthous ulcers. As I said to you before, the commonest is what we refer to as minor. But of course, we have herpetiform, which is smaller ulcers again. And I'll show a clinical photo of that. And of course, the most significant is major aphthous ulcer. And the reason for this is, of course, the scarring uh, which can be quite debilitating and indeed lead to trismus. Now, of course, whenever one of our patients presents with typical aphthous ulceration, what we need to see, uh, appropriately consider is whether or not this is reflective of an underlying systemic condition. So with the, with the taking of a history and if necessary, with appropriate consent and also a chaperone, we need to consider the possibility of Bechet's disease, and in these patients, they'll typically present not just with ulcers of the omicosa, but there'll be genital involvement as well. We also know in a small percentage of patients with true celiac disease will present with aphthous-like, not necessarily distinctly aphthous ulcers as part of their initial presentation. So here is a means for us as a dentist to under identify a potentially very serious systemic condition. So here you have the typical features of recurrent aphthous ulceration. It tends to involve all omicosal surfaces, and it doesn't particularly discriminate between the keratinized and non-keratinized surfaces. This is herpetiform ulceration, and it's well named. You've got hundreds of very discrete ulcers, less than one to two millimeters. And over the course of the ulceration, which again is generally about two weeks to three weeks in duration, these ulcers will co coalesce to form the one ulcer. Then we have major aphthous ulcers. These generally tend to start in the teenage years. They tend to be seen in the history of minor aphthous ulceration. So you get this ulceration on top of the minor aphthous ulcers that the patient's already uh, troubled by. And these are large ulcers, larger than a centimetre. They involve the full thickness of the epithelium and Unfortunately, they can lead to serious and severe and disabling scarring on Healy. So if you look carefully at this clinical photograph, and hopefully there is some sort of arrow for you to watch, we can see the white areas here where scarring has occurred secondary to these major aphthous ulcers. So when we're considering a patient with apathy, uh, we need to ask a series of questions in turn, not just presentation of the ulcers, but any associated gastrointestinal upsets, such as irregular bowel habit with diarrhea, uh, particularly a history of worsening diarrhea on eating foods high in gluten. So that means any foods that are a cereal. And 
Of course, management will be about reducing incidental trauma in some form of corticosteroids, either topically or systemically. So here we have uh, my recommendations for the management of recurrent aptus ulceration in addition to the investigations we need to undertake appropriately to exclude underlying systemic diseases. Now, the steroid sparing agents generally are required for patients with major aptus ulceration. This fortunately is very rare. In my country here in Australia, access to thalidomide is very problematic because of the history of this drug as a very uh, potent uh, mutagenic agent. Indeed, it is now easier for us to get hold of the monoclonal antibodies directed against TNF-alpha, which seems to be the major cytokine associated with the development of these ulcers. Now, as I said to you before, and you would be familiar with the fact that celiac disease has a variety of oral and indeed dental presentations. Typically, there is scoring of the enamel and localized band of enamel hyperplasia. Of course, this is not necessarily specific for celiac disease. We see all sorts of enamel alterations, particularly seemingly as a one-off event is highlighted in these incisors with a variety of uh, immune-mediated bowel disorders. And as I said to you before, we tend not to get strictly aptus type ulcers, which is a nice symmetrical ulcer. They tend to be what we call apteform or aptus-like. So their presentation tends to be somewhat irregular, uh, but they have a similar history of painful ulcers for one to two weeks before they remit. Now, of course, thinking about conditions uh, of the bowel that might present and involving the oral cavity, uh, whenever we see a patient presenting to us with full thick lips and intraorally ulceration or so-called cobblestoning of the buccal mucosa, we need to be thinking that this is a patient with orofacial granitosis. And then, of course, if we have a child with a clinical diagnosis of orofacial granitosis, we need to be thinking about potentially underlying systemic diseases that might be the driver or the cause for this particular presentation. So orofacial granitosis is literally swelling by infiltration with the tissues adversely affected by the development and presence of sterile, that is, granuloma. So this is a frustrated inflammatory response dominated by giant cells, which I'll show the histology for, and macrophages and, and um, monocytes gathering together. <clears throat> In terms of the intraoral presentation, we tend to see a variety of patterns of presentation. We can see a combination of all of these clinical presentations, or we can have one or only of these particular uh, clinical forms of orofacial granitosis. Typically, we'll see infiltration of the gingival tissues, particularly the buccal gingiva. We see cobblestoning, which on palpation will be quite firm. And we've got this appearance like cobblestones have been laid inside the yellow cavity. It's typically bilateral, as is the serpentinous, this snake-like ulceration of the depths of the mandibular buccal sulcus, again, bilaterally. So as I said, swelling of the lip, shallow ulceration of the labial and the maxillary, and maxillary labial sulcus. But the distinctive feature to be looking for in the patient with orofacial granitosis is this so-called stag horny. So what's occurring here is that there's infiltration and induration of the tissues in and around the submandibular ducts and their orifices, and they become very prominent. And when we see this sign, we need to be very suspicious that this may be indeed a strong fe a feature pathognomonic for underlying Crohn's disease. So as I said, biopsy is necessary to secure the diagnosis, looking for typical non-caseating sterile uh, granuloma associated with giant cell formation that we see highlighted here in a biopsy taken with a patient of orofacial granitosis. Once we're confronted by a patient with orofacial granitosis, our investigations are basically directed to determine if there is underlying systemic disease. So there's standard blood tests, which includes a full blood count, iron studies, B12 and folate. And if we're seeing features of anemia, particularly in a child who's otherwise well fed, then we need to be start being suspicious they have some form of inflammatory bowel disease, where there's either loss through chronic bleeding of iron and associated B12 and folate 
via the gastrointestinal tract, or there is a failure to absorb these key mineral and um, uh, and items or uh, uh, agents that require for appropriate red blood cell synthesis. You can do inflammatory markers such as CRP and ESR, but remembering that these are not particularly sensitive in differentiating between underlying bowel disease and or oral presentation. In rare instances, we can see this swelling of the lips and associated ulceration and infiltration of the intraoral tissues in the setting of sarcoidosis, but this is very uncommon indeed. And it is relatively easy to exclude sarcoidosis by undertaking a serum angiotensin converting enzyme assessment. One of the key investigations that facilitates diagnosis of underlying inflammatory bowel disease is the so-called fecal calprotectin. So a small sample of feces is collected from the child and we measure this particular uh, uh, element called calprotectin. If it's significantly raised, it's very suggestive of some form of inflammatory bowel disease. And in the context of the infiltration and features of orofacial granitosis, <clears throat> it makes one very suspicious that we're dealing with a patient likely to have Crohn's disease as opposed to the other inflammatory bowel disease, that is ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> so on the blood test, if you wish to differentiate between these two inflammatory bowel diseases, the investigation of choice is looking for an ASCA, so serum ASCA versus serum ANCA. So the ASCA is anti-saccharomyces psoriasis antibodies, and these generally are positive in the patient with underlying Crohn's disease where in patients with Crohn's, their ANCA, so their anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, tend to be negative. So there's a strong predictive value and a strong positive for ASCA and negative for ANCA. And conversely, for patients with ulcerative colitis, also another inflammatory bowel disorder, these patients tend to have a strong P ANCA, but negative ASCA. And as I said, this is done in combination with the fecal calprotectin. Now, ulcerative colitis, very rarely, so this is a true orphan disease in terms of its oral manifestations, rarely presents in the oral cavity. It more typically presents with skin lesions. When it does present in the oral cavity, we see something we refer to as pyostomatitis vegetans. And you have these very superficial, widely scattered ulceration with desquamation that's way beyond the attached gingiva. It's an irregular, inconsistent clinical finding. And I have to state that in 30 years of clinical practice, I've only seen one example of this. Also, the colitis differs very significantly from Crohn's disease. Firstly, there are not the typical giant cells or granulomas to be found in the tissue. Secondly, it is very much uniquely confined to the colon and you get widespread superficial ulceration along the length of the large bowel or the colon. With Crohn's disease, any part of the gastrointestinal system can be involved, starting with the oral cavity and all the way down to the, to the um, anus. So in terms of ulcerative colitis, as I said, it's rare that it has oral or indeed dental manifestations. More typically, we tend to see skin lesions have a similar appearance to what we see here in the mouth, where we get proliferation, desquamation, and selective scoriation of the affected tissues. It also has a strong association with a arthritic condition, that of ankylizing spondylitis. So this concurrence needs to be considered in our history taking, asking for, of our patients who present uh, with gastrointestinal upset if there is any coincident uh, arthritic changes or the history of arthritis. Now, as I said, Crohn's disease has a variety of presentations. You get so-called skip lesions, where one part of the bowel may be affected, but the next part of the bowel is completely spared. What we see on endoscopy and colonoscopy is again is superficial ulceration, but more typically we see this cobblestoning that we may occasionally see in the oral cavity, as well as mucosal tags. And so these are the relevant findings, which are then confirmed by biopsy in the terms of the finding of the granuloma. Now, in terms of the management of the oral manifestations of Crohn's, or indeed those select patients who don't have an underlying systemic condition, but just have straight oral facial granitosis, there's a role for topical corticosteroids in the form of mouthwash or indeed ointments. Um, 
intralesional steroids where we directly inject steroids into the affected swollen lip have a uh, certainly have a place in the management, particularly when there are cosmetic issues, uh, which are of concern. And also we can occasionally uh, pulse the patient. I, that is an important part of my practice in that if I will give the patient a trial of uh, uh, a trial of the systemic prednisolone to see that they're going to be responsive to intra uh, intralesional injections of uh, corticosteroids. Uh, what one also has to accept, certainly in the setting of Crohn's disease, these patients will work through a variety of agents, but we're seeing that the, the monoclonal antibodies, particularly again, directly against TNF-alpha, are showing great promise in terms of disease modification, avoiding the need for surgery, that is surgical resection of the affected uh, bowel, and providing patients with basically the same life expectancy in, that we see with patients without uh, Crohn's disease. What's also useful to appreciate is that if we do are seeing a patient with the eye manifestations of Crohn's disease, sometimes it, uh, it's useful to wait to see if the underlying systemic therapy will benefit the eye manifestations or complications before proceeding, particularly with invasive procedures such as intralesional corticosteroid injections. One important practice note I'll share with all of you is in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly when they start at a young age, these patients are particularly susceptible to developing osteoporosis, typically younger than seen with typical osteoporosis. So these patients are going to be placed in bone modifying agents, which as you know, put them at our patients potentially at risk of medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw with future dental uh, treatments such as extractions. Now, what else can present in the oral cavity? Very, very rare. Well, there are a variety of uh, autosomal dominant conditions which are known as the familial adenomatosis polyposis syndromes. And literally, these patients develop anything up to thousands of typically initially benign uh, polyps or adenopolyps of the entire gastrointestinal sit, but particularly of the colon and the small intestine. Unfortunately, in the setting of Gardner's syndrome, a fair percentage of these will progress to become colon cancer. And it is still unfortunately a fact that in patients with Gardner's syndrome, their life expectancy is much shorter because of this risk of colon, uh, development of colon cancer. The presentation dentally is of supernumerary teeth and or os true osteomas. So what will be required here if one wants to facilitate the diagnosis is biopsy to differentiate the osteoma, say, for example, from Toro. But a strong family history recalling that this condition is autosomal dominant will give us a clear indication whether or not the patient truly has Gardner syndrome. And of course, now we have genetic testing available to us where we look for defects for the uh, chromosome responsible for adenoma formation, and that can be very sensitive in terms of screening patients, but also importantly, their siblings uh, in terms of their potential risk for Gardner syndrome. What these patients are going to require on diagnosis of Gardner syndrome is very frequent endoscopy and colonoscopy plus surgery for any of these adenomas which are showing suspicious features such as independent growth or bleeding. Similarly, another form of familiar adenosis polypi syndromes is that of puts jaeger syndrome. Now, of course, we frequently see pigmented lesions in and of the oral cavity and soft tissues. And of course, whenever we see a pigmented lesion, whether it's single or multiple, we need to be thinking to ourselves, what is the source of pigmentation? Is it intrinsic to the patient in the form of melanin or something that's been extrinsic and found its way into the tissues? And most typically, of course, in and around the oral cavity and the teeth in particular, we're going to see maybe residue of amalgam embedded into the tissues, the so-called amalgam tattoo, as we see here in this bottom slide. Now, when we see pigmentation, it may be single, or in this case, diffuse with multiple uh, of multiple sites. This is physiological pigmentation and is needs to be understood and considered in that particular context, as opposed to this presentation, where we have multiple distinct melanotic macules but in very large numbers, 
and these may be prominently scattered over the skin. But of course, they're taking a particular prominence because of the structure of the lip when they affect the lip and the gingival mucosa. So in Pertz Jaeger syndrome, once again, we get the development of uh, generally benign hematomas polyps or benign adenomas of the large bowel, the colon. But what we now are aware of is that there are other cancers, particularly pancreatic cancer, that these patients are at risk of, which sees their life expectancy unfortunately shortened. And not surprisingly, the diagnosis rests on family history being an autosomal dominant disease. So it's like, therefore, one of the parents is likely to have had this particular disease. These days, though, on recognition of these familiar, um, uh, these conditions of familiar uh, polyposis of the gastrointestinal tract, particularly when it's recognized as an adult, these uh, adults will undergo genetic screening to see if they truly have these conditions and therefore advice can be given in terms of uh, family planning. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you all. Please accept my apologies for the difficulties had with the IT. And uh, I'm, hopefully we have some time still for some further questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I have um, I have received a question um, now. It is more pertaining to the pediatric population. Um, so often we see uh, oral candida infections in babies. So thrush. Um, how often do you have to treat with more than one antifungal uh, in the case of thrush? Um, so, for example, okay. that one first antifungal would not be sufficient and then you have to add another one or do another course. Sure. So the thing, the first thing is always to get the diagnosis right. So we know that oral candidiasis or thrush is a disease of the disease. So there's a couple of things we need to be thinking about. First and foremost, are there local factors or are there systemic factors that may place the child at developing candidiasis? Now the local factors and the systemic factors are generally the same in that there is some um, impairment of the immune system. When we consider the local factors, the most significant reason why candidiasis may be presenting is there's some impairment in salivary flow or that the patient is having a diet that's rich, very rich in sugars and rich in acids, which impairs saliva and allows for the overgrowth of the candidal species into the, of the oral cavity. In most young children, oral candidiasis or thrush is generally due to uh, diet uh, is generally not in keeping with some significant underlying systemic disorder. However, if you have a young person, particularly an infant, with candidiasis that is resistant to tropical antifungal agents, then you need to be start asking yourself the question, is something more going on? And is there an element of systemic immunosuppression going on that's reflected in the presence of the candidiasis? Typically, cyclic neutropenia or profound neutropenia will result in candidiasis. Undiagnosed diabetes, particularly type 1 di diabetes, presenting uh, initially in the, in the child in terms of a form of candidiasis. Uh, and, of course, the mucocutaneous uh, candidal conditions, where these patients will not only have candidiasis, particularly chronic, difficult to treat or refractory candidiasis of their own cavity, but you'll see it involving the nappy, the skin folds, uh, and it'll be generally readily evident in other sites outside of the mouth. Now, in those cases of very severe candidiasis that are resistant to topical agents, then we need to consider appropriate systemic agents. The azo antifungal agents given systemically, as long as we're careful to screen for any potential drugs, are very safe to use, but always the question, why is this candidiasis so, recurrent, so difficult to treat? Is something more going on that needs to be investigated by means of a full blood count and a proper workup for the conditions that I've mentioned? Uh, excellent, excellent. This is um, so interesting uh, that you're mentioning uh, that the presence of sugar and that candida thrives in the presence of sugar. Now, I've, I've heard of this um, very interesting study um, going through thousands and thousands of charts um, using uh, EPIC, which is an electronic uh, medical record in the United States, where they found a pretty significant association between early childhood caries and being a carrier of candida. Um, so the carriers were more likely. So it seems that 
Canada thrives with sugar, but also plays a role in this biofilm that uh, plays a role in, 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 in early childhood caries, which yeah. as a pediatric that dentist uh, yeah. int that, interests that, me. That doesn't come as a surprise. I think the other thing to bear in mind, is because it's so rare, it's only come to me afterwards, but there are, of course, a few uh, rare number of patients, and it's truly rare, who have a genesis of their salivary glands. And their presentation will be with chronic candidiasis that's difficult to treat because the absence of the saliva with this buffering capacity and also its antimicrobial activity is absent. You tend to see the more severe forms of candidiasis. Okay. Um... So I'll um, like to now uh, see with Professor Ella Lucy. Uh, donc, Professor Ella Lucy, voyons uh, si uh, vous arrivez uh, à avoir une, une présentation. Donc, je vous prie de vous mettre uh, sur uh, le microphone actif. D'accord. Uh, et... Oui, cet écran sélectionné. Alors, oui. si vous le voulez bien, euh, nous avons euh, déjà présenté beaucoup de, de contenu et donc je pense que nous pourrons euh, continuer euh, ce, cette présentation à un autre temps puisque le, le temps alloué euh, est déjà épuisé. Uh, and uh, we have been able to uh, actually present a good amount of content. And uh, I believe that we may have to have a part two uh, for, uh, for Professor Ala Lucy. Um, Professor Ala Lucy, je voudrais vous donner uh, la parole pour que vous puissiez uh, nous donner uh, le mot de la fin sur euh, les euh, conditions bucco-dentaires et les maladies rares chez l'enfant. Euh, donc, euh, la parole est à vous. Vous êtes à la recherche de la meilleure formation professionnelle en matière de santé Des cours en ligne ou en présentiel Des ateliers pratiques, des conférences, des congrès, mais aussi des symposiums, des webinaires et bien plus encore BK Med Events est la meilleure plateforme de connexion entre les professionnels de la santé et les acteurs de la formation continue. Sur la plateforme en ligne de BK Med Events, vous allez retrouver tout ce qu'il vous faut des prestataires du monde entier. Nabil. Nabil. Nabil, qu'est-ce que tu m'as Oui. Comment je fais d'abord pour partager l'écran Ah, il y a la fenêtre, ah, voilà. la présentation, il y a partagé, qu'est-ce que je fais Écoutez, tu n'as pas le... Allez. Désactiver le son paramètre. Qu'est-ce que je fais, demain Hein On l'a dit tout l'écran on, on, pourra, on pourra passer sur, euh, sur le téléphone. Hein Moi, je me dis la fenêtre, là, tout l'écran. Excusez-moi de vous interrompre, mais le temps consacré à la présentation, euh, il est presque terminé. Donc, on voudrait bien juste un petit, pomme, un petit mot de la fin, comme l'a précisé le docteur Nabil, sur les maladies rares euh, de l'enfant. Oui, avoir... La présentation, est-ce qu'elle peut être euh, visible Non. Pour le moment, depuis tout à l'heure, on a essayé, ça n'a pas abouti. Donc, juste un petit mot de la fin. On pourra récupérer ça peut-être lors d'un prochain webinaire. À vous la parole, docteur. C'est dommage. Alors, euh, alors, en fait, euh, l'odontologiste, il est très concerné. Est-ce euh, est que vous regardez ce que je fais <rire>
d'odontologiste est très non, non, on ne voit que vous. Les syndromes génétiques rares peuvent impliquer l'odontologiste non seulement pour son rôle de relais, pour le pédiatre ou le médecin généticien, euh, son rôle de diagnostic surtout pour les cas dont les signes dentaires sont plus importants et plus précoces. Il peut participer dans le diagnostic des maladies rares et la génétique n'est pas seulement pour les généticiens, elle est aussi pour les, pour les cliniciens, les médecins, les, les dentistes. Euh, sur les 5000 syndromes génétiques connus, 700 ont une composante dento-orofaciale et plus de 250 présents dans leur tableau clinique infant la biopalatine. Cinq syndromes sont découverts chaque jour dans le monde. Le Maroc est un pays à forte consanguinité. La découverte des anomalies dentaires par le chirurgien dentiste, leur description et inscription dans le dossier médical, peut participer au diagnostic médical de ces affections, sachant aussi que euh, ces maladies rares sont caractérisées par un début précoce, donc euh, chez le jeune. C'est pour ça que les pédodentistes sont concernés par, euh, par l'étude des maladies rares. Les douleurs chroniques et malades sur cinq, donc ça, ça touche la qualité de la vie. La survenue d'une déficience motrice sensorielle ou intellectuelle dans un cas sur deux. Et la mise en jeu, la mise en jeu du pronostic vital dans presque la moitié des cas. Donc, il est très important de poser un diagnostic de ces maladies pour pouvoir poser, euh, traiter, pour pouvoir traiter ces problèmes. Euh, D'autre part, euh, euh, toute la communauté internationale et nationale sont structurées vers la prise en charge des personnes démunies ou malades, y compris les syndromes génétiques, car sont dans une situation où ils ont besoin plus d'accompagnement et de prise en charge à vie. Alors, euh, euh, vous savez que euh, l'interaction épithélium misanchimateuse entre le misanchime et l'épithélium pendant le quatrième mois de la vie interétérine, euh, là, on a des choses qui touchent les dents et les cheveux, les dents et les reins, les dents, euh, les poumons, les glandes mammaires. C'est pour ça qu'on peut avoir des signes dentaires et des signes généraux associés. Et, et, et le dentiste doit connaître ça pour pouvoir poser un diagnostic. Euh, alors, rôle de l'odontologiste, il peut diagnostic, traitement, l'accompagnement psychologique. Remarquez euh, un cas de syndrome euh, de l'incisive centrale médiane. C'est l'exemple le, typique que, que l'odontologiste peut rendre service. Une seule incisive au milieu, ça doit alerter l'odontologiste parce que ça peut être associé à une holo, holoprosencéphalie. Et, et une, une IRM cérébrale est, est importante, absence d'anomalie au niveau du corps caliaque dans ce cas, et petit kyste de la corne frontale, ventricule latérale gauche, et ça peut entraîner la mort à 12 ans. À 7 ans, on peut faire le diagnostic de le syndrome d'incisive centrale euh, avec un risque de l'oprogencéphalie. On va adresser au neurochirurgien, au neurologue, qui va prendre en charge ce cas pour voir est-ce qu'il y a ce risque de l'oprogencéphalie. Et c'est l'odontologiste qui va alerter. Parce que lui, il y a le seul signe, il est dentaire, précoce. C'est l'incisive centrale médiane. Et on va sauver cet enfant parce qu'une euh, oloprosencéphalie peut être mortelle. Alors, autre chose, euh, deux hémisphères en continuité au niveau frontal avec une insuffisance anti-épophysaire avec une atrisico anale, anomalie faciale mineure. Mais ce qui est important, c'est de diagnostiquer l'incisive centrale médiane. Euh, en notre cas, le syndrome de Lichnian. Lichnian qui entraîne des automutilations, c'est une maladie rare récessive liée à X. En cela, il y a une déficience d'inenzyme qui entraîne une production excessive d'acide urique. L'enfant atteint semble normal pendant les premiers mois de sa vie et se rassemble alors par des lésions du tissu neurologique rénaux et musculosquelettique. Les personnes atteintes de syndrome de Lichnian présentent un comportement d'automutilation. Il va se mordre la lèvre, la langue, les doigts, sans sentir. Et, et, et ça va entraîner des pertes de substances avec une automutilation, avec un problème fonctionnel et esthétique. Et la qualité de la vie, remarquez ces, ces images où il y a perte de, du doigt, il y a perte de la lèvre inférieure, il y a perte des dents, aspect typique de morsures chroniques, des lèvres avec perte de tissu cicatrice hypertrophique et des dents fraîches, amputation partielle d'un doigt par un patient qui s'est libéré de ses sangles, protection sans contention, perte de la langue dans ce cas, remarquez, euh, 
et un traumatisme de la langue, avec aspect de la langue élève suite à l'utilisation même avec la part de la gouttière pour la protection, et il se fait mordre la lèvre aussi avec des morsures. Et ça, c'est des traumatismes de langue la verve, remarqué dans ce cas, la joue et le doigt. Et automutilation, perte du tissu, lèvre inférieure au niveau de la langue. Et parfois, on est très limité. La gouttière maxillaire mandibulaire n'est pas suffisante parce qu'il dépasse ses gouttières et il fait mordre aussi à travers ses gouttières aussi. Ce n'est pas suffisant. Les plaques de contention avec des, des crochets aussi, ce n'est pas suffisant parce qu'il va au-delà, parce que la force et la nécessité d'automutilation est beaucoup plus importante que, que la, le pouvoir protecteur de ces appareils. Alors, il euh, y a aussi un autre, un autre astuce pour protéger, c'est de mettre cet embout d'un langue suite à une morsure et pourtant, pourtant ça ne marche pas. Il y a une autre approche très radicale, celle d'extraire toutes les dents temporaires. Et c'est une approche qui, qui est très logique pour les cas pour lesquels euh, la discussion va se faire entre euh, perdre toutes les dents temporaires ou avoir des mutilations, en, ou perdre de la langue, une partie de la langue ou de la lèvre ou, ou des doigts. Et, et c'est très logique de le faire dans certains cas. Euh, les approches sont psychologiques, pharmacologiques, l'appareil de protection, chirurgie, reste en 2023, on est très limité pour traiter le syndrome de Lichnian parce qu'il y a très peu de moyens de, de protection de, de, contre les automédulations. Voilà. En notre cas, euh, si, si, si je dépasse le temps, vous me dites. Alors, pour le rachit... Alors, justement, je voulais poser une question par rapport euh, justement au syndrome d'automutilation, euh, ce sont des cas qui sont très difficiles à gérer. Uh, I am wondering if our colleagues from Australia are still with us. Um, so the question that I was raising is about automutilation uh, problems. So Lesch-Nehan uh, syndrome, for example, as a... Uh, Uh, disease uh, always very difficult to to to, to manage. Have um, is is it something where you have to resort to the the extraction of teeth or the extraction of many teeth or of all teeth? Uh, and this is probably something that uh, Professor Richard Woodmer would also be able to speak about. Um, but is that something that you've encountered had to be done? Et vous, euh, professeur Alalussi, est-ce que c'est une, une situation que vous avez rencontrée d'avoir à faire l'extraction de dents euh, définitives ou, ou, ou primaires parce que l'enfant se mutilait So, in case of auto mutilation. Oui, j'ai extrait les dents, temp les dents temporaires, de la canine à la canine. Mais so ce n'est pas suffisant. Teeth were, were extracted. Ce n'est pas suffisant. Parce qu'il reste aussi les molaires temporaires. Il va se mutiler avec les molaires. Et je so mets even with the molars, they, they can uh, create significant damage to the oral cavity. Et on, est très, on est très limité dans ces cas. Même si on extrait And les canines, à la rigueur, euh, le séquel, c'est qu'il y aura des retards d'éruption des dents permanentes. And voilà. anybody has seen success with appliances? Est-ce qu'il y a des gens qui ont eu du succès avec des appareils? With appliances. Anybody? The appliances for less than no, no, it's very difficult. They, yes, the teeth usually all come out. Okay, donc une extraction de complète des dents, so full full mouth extraction. Um, the the organizers are indicating to me that we have uh, used up the time that we had today. Donc, on m'indique qu'on a utilisé la totalité du temps qui était disponible. Uh, je suis très content que vous ayez tous pu participer. Very happy that all of you have been able to join us. Uh, we could probably go on like this for days. Nous pourrions probablement parler comme ça pendant des jours. Uh, L'organisation nous indique qu'on doit mettre fin. Uh, je voudrais remercier uh, 
les organisateurs, le groupe Tawassoul et Bekamed, euh, pour avoir euh, facilité l'organisation de ce, cet événement. So thank you very much for helping organize this event. Um, alors, je voudrais tous vous souhaiter une bonne journée, une bonne soirée, good evening or good day, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, je voudrais aussi dire de inviter. On voudrait inviter Widmer et Shifter un jour in Morocco. So hopefully one day uh, bien to invite en you uh, from Australia to Morocco. Yes. To uh, talk about these topics. We would like that. Oh. Merci. Okay. Au revoir, Mustafa. Thank you very Merci. much, everybody. Merci Au revoir, à Marc. Yeah. Bonjour. <laughs> Au revoir, <Nabil. laughs> Cheers, Marc. Thank you. Oh.